get that for you guys because the next city that we're gonna go to is gonna be much more residential, like more like a real city and won't have as many colors and lights and like big loud music and vendors running in your face. So yeah, just wanted to have that contrast. Morning coffee in this shop. So it's like really nice in here and then you go outside and it's like Colombian vibe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now I'm one of those people that like takes a picture of my food, but guess how much this was? This was this was sixteen thousand. This is about sixteen thousand pesos, which is like how much is sixteen thousand pesos? It's like it's like three dollars. Three twenty-five, something like that. Yeah. The streets of Cartagena and this water. Ah. He is pissing through the balcony. <laughs> in this video because I'm in like this quiet office space and it's really just because I wanted the sound to be a little bit better but I also don't want to be too loud to interrupt everybody else's working so I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, dating and the Orthodox Jewish community what it's like um, what it was like for me um, so I grew up going to an all-girls school system called Beis Yaakov. Most people in the Orthodox Jewish community will know, will have heard about it. It's an all-girls private school system um, that is like the most disciplined one, the most disciplined mainstream Orthodox girls school. And uh, there's a lot of rules um, when you're part of that school. It's not as they tell you when you start studying there. It's you know, it's not just a school, it's like a lifestyle, like you have to commit to a certain way of dressing, a certain way of um, living your life, of, you commit to a certain way of, of like, you know, you're committing to letting go of certain literatures, you know, anything secular, secular music, secular, you know, internet, television, um, you're committing to a much more pious, Orthodox lifestyle. Uh, you're in certain schools, and they have this school all over the country, all over the world. Actually, they have Beis Yaakov's all over the world. Beis Yaakov, that's what it's called. Uh, that's like the Ashkenazi way of saying Beth Jacob. So, um, yeah, they have this all over the world. And in certain schools, they won't let you have a phone, they won't let you drive uh, as a girl. Um, very stringent, like, you know, keeping women within the faith uh, practices, and um, there's, it's a lot of fun for a lot of people, like, you know, it's like its own little community of girls. They have summer camps that kind of follow this structure, uh, they have seminaries that follow the structure, like the seminary that I went to and I studied in for a year in Jerusalem after high school. Um, and a lot of people's like lifestyles are very heavily influenced by this school system. You know, they help you prepare for marriage um, as an Orthodox Jewish woman. And you know, I can go, I can go into the details of like how Beis Yaakov was started and the whole reasoning behind it. And you know, maybe in a different video I'll do that. But what this video is actually about is dating, dating in that community, in a commun in a Beis Yaakov influenced community, which tends to be more ultra orthodox, more yeshivish, um, more like uh, sheltered from 
the secular world. You know, it's like an, it's like the opposite of secular dating. So what it was like for me, the community that I grew up in was based in LA, California. And um, it was the, the dating system for girls like me, like in my community, in my, you know, status of religion uh, was through a matchmaker. So we dated through a matchmaker. Um, typically what girls in my school would do was they would, after high school, they would spend a year studying in Jerusalem or in anywhere else that was where there was like a base Yaakov seminary, but usually it was in, in Israel. So we would study for a year in Israel, uh, study about like everything that there is to know about like Tanakh, the, you know, texts, um, you know, biblical texts, pr uh, prophetic books, um, laws, halachic laws, um, you know, like everything that we needed to know in terms of like Jewish family and lifestyle and, um, but to that standard. And um, a lot of people after seminary would go on to either become like teachers in that movement, they become, you know, like rabbinic female teachers, um, but not, but in, in the ultra orthodox way, which is di very different than like what we have nowadays, like female rabbis, nothing like that. It's, it's within the community, um, becoming a teacher uh, for women. We actually didn't study Talmud. We didn't study Aramaic like the boys did. Very different type of studying for women as was for men. For, for women it was more, in my opinion, it was more brainwashy and uh, like the men were actually more uh, focused on like the scriptures and they're more focused on debating and exploring, uh, exploring the Talmud, exploring the law, going back and forth. There was more room for questioning. Um, there weren't curfews, you know what I mean? For the women, it was very different. It was more, this is how things are, not a lot of questioning. And it, in fact, I used to ask questions and I, I didn't really feel like my questions were very well received. Not to get too much into that, just giving you a little background on uh, women versus men. Um, and then after seminary, what would happen is usually you would get into the matchmaking system, the orthodox matchmaking system, which is you know there's a matchmaker um gets paid out you know the way that they make their money is after they make a match you give them a gift depending on the matchmaker uh usually a couple thousand dollars um once they set up two people and it's a successful match that goes to marriage um so you get in with the matchmaker and the matchmaker will tell you like you know, you'll, you'll tell them like what you're looking for in a guy, if you want him to be a working guy or a learning guy. Um, usually what they mean, what I mean by that is in that community, some women, you know, some families, uh, some families, the men would work and be providers for the family. And some families, the men would be full-time scholars. They would just study Torah. That's all they would do all day, they would study the Talmud and study, you know, halachic law or texts or whatever they're studying um, that is part of, that is considered part of Tanakh. So would you, and, and the women would have to be the breadwinners. So it was like, it's called kolel and it's a very popular lifestyle within the modern ultra-Orthodox Jewish community. Um, a lot of people outside, like in the secular world have never heard of this before but it's very popular, it's huge, it's a very thriving movement in Israel. And in fact, in Israel, a lot of men, because they're kolel, they're studying full time, uh, they'll get exemptions from joining the army because this is taken so seriously. So, um, in, so back to Orthodox dating in LA. Um, and it, it's like this in New York too. Some people from my community would actually move to New York to date because there was a wider selection of men. Um, so girls and guys would do that too. They would move to New York because the, the Jewish, the Orthodox Jewish community was a lot bigger in New York. So they would, you know, move there for dating and for meeting with matchmakers. Um, so 
I felt like, um, so for me, that's how it was, like, basically, I would go to a matchmaker, tell them what I was looking for, they would set you up with a person that, like, matches how you are. You also needed, as part of that system, you needed a shidduch resume, which is basically, it's like a job resume, but it's for dating, and it's basically outlines, like, who you are, you know, who your parents are, your birthday, your height, uh, sometimes your weight, uh, a few references about you, your education, where you studied, what you do, and sometimes like people will add a paragraph about themselves, a picture always if you're a girl. Um, not necessarily if you're a guy, they don't always provide a picture. So um, yeah, they'll basically just like have all these things outlined. I'm just gonna add really quickly. Um, so. The reason why the dating system is so like manicured and it sounds very much like a job interview almost like, you know, you go out on these dates, you know, you provide like a resume and then you have like, the meetings and the meetings are very moderated by the matchmaker. They're highly uh, business like, like, you know, you, you enjoy with the person and get to know your chemistry with them. But a lot of it is also like very down to business, asking them questions about themselves. They ask you questions and it's very rigid. And a lot of that is necessary because in that community, like you, you're raised to not be having regular contact with the opposite sex. You know, you're raised not being allowed to physically touch the opposite sex. Um, you're not allowed to communicate with them as part of the school system, you know, so when it's time for marriage, usually girls tend to be very, uh, not very comfortable. And some girls, you know, messed around in high school, they broke the rules, but overall, most girls tend to be like a little naive, um, you know, just don't know how to talk to guys. So, uh, and by the way, it was a lot more common for guys to break the rules than for girls to break the rules. Girls did break the rules, but at least when I was growing up, the girls were more likely to follow the rules. So um, they, we needed this like matchmaking structure to like kind of guide us into the, into the dating process. So yeah, they would do that. You'd go on a few dates. Uh, when I was there, um, kind of like the more accepted way of looking at whether your dates were going well was if after third if after three dates the guy tries to get your number and starts communicating with you um, without going through the matchmaker you know that it's successful and then after about 10 dates if he proposes to you and basically you know says like let's get married and usually you know if that's going to happen then you know that you're like serious so and so usually they get usually after after three days actually it's considered serious and after 10 dates, it's, you're basically like getting married. So um, that's, those were the numbers that were around when I was dating in the system, which was like starting 10 years ago. 10 years ago is when I started in that system. And I only stayed, I only lasted for a couple of years. Um, I left by the time I was like 23, 24. So basically, uh, you know, started at 19, like when I came back from Jerusalem. And then, so just for a few years, I did that. Uh, and what I found was they put a lot of pressure on the girls to get married. They put a lot of pressure on girls to like, you know, say yes to this guy, say yes that. They told us that there was a shidduch crisis, which means that um, there's more women, you know, the shidduch crisis when I was in the dating world. I don't know how it is now, but when I was, you know, when I was dating, they would tell us that there was more men, sorry, there's more women than men. And they were actually probably correct. There's, you know, women were less likely to leave the Orthodox Jewish community than men were. So, or at least they were more likely, uh, sorry. Yeah, men were more likely to leave that community and those rules, the rigid rules, than women. So basically what ended up happening most of the time is that there were like very few good guys uh, that stuck around to date the very many girls. And in fact, not only did our community have a plethora of highly willing women, women that were willing to like 
bend over backwards for this lifestyle, which was actually not really very beneficial to women, in my opinion, but that's just my opinion. So this very, and for many reasons, this lifestyle is not beneficial for women, but for me, at least, because I like to explore and travel and like do things. So, um, but women were just more likely to stay in it because they were more likely to believe what people in authority told them. So the women were always more likely to stay. And so what ended up happening was there was a more of a plethora of women in these communities than men. And so the shit crisis meant that um, for every however many guys there were, there was always like way more women that were willing to date them. And um, then there's always like the 80-20 rule that people bring up and it's like this in the secular world too where they say like for every 20%, you know, 20 guy, you know, for, for the 20% of men that girl, you know, there's like 80% of the women are flocking to those 20% of guys and vers vice versa, you know, I'm not, I, I don't know if I'm making sense, but um, they have versions of this shidduch crisis all over. It's not just in the Orthodox Jewish community, but they used it a lot. The matchmakers pushed this idea a lot to get us women to like keep going out with guys that either we weren't attracted to or we just didn't respect or like they, they you know and uh, you know they were they, they were all really nice the people that I date that I went on dates with always very nice guys but I just never was attracted to anybody <laughs> you know like it was really hard for me to feel attracted to anybody and uh, I always felt like a little bit you know I always felt a little bit trapped like even if I liked someone I felt like if I kept going out with them, I would get trapped into this system that I didn't like at all. You know, it's like, even if they were nice, I didn't really feel like I belonged in that community. So I kept finding excuses of things that I didn't like about them. When the reality is I just didn't like the community as a whole for me, the lifestyle, I didn't like the, the lifestyle as a whole. So I would keep finding excuses of why I didn't like these guys um, and why I wasn't attracted to them. So um, for me, it was like, I just, you know, would keep going on dates and, and then, you know, friends and family would be like, why aren't you getting married? Why aren't you putting effort into getting married? You know, why are, you know, your clock is ticking. Like no one's gonna marry you after uh, 26. That was the age, nobody will marry. And 26 at the time felt very old. So I was like, okay, like I'm definitely gonna get married before 26 and I'm 29 now. 26 felt very old and now to me 26 feels young but anyway uh yeah that was something that people were always saying like you're not putting enough effort and then i would feel like dude i'm putting so much effort what are you talking about i'm like going on so many dates with people that i don't even like that i know even in the beginning like i know i'm not gonna like them like i, I would still go on dates because maybe i would change my mind maybe you know i was trying to be open-minded and no matter how open-minded i tried to be i just didn't like anybody and because the reason is because i didn't even want to be there in the first place you know so uh, that's how dating was for me. I did that for a few years, you know, I'd like keep going on dates and then, and it was very rigid. There was one guy that I liked uh, that I, towards the end, and I'll say his name because it's a generic name. His name was David. I really liked this guy, David. So he was like a little bit different. He was a little bit like a bad boy. And so he kind of had a more, a mix of like, the community vibe but he also had kind of a secular vibe and that was like the first guy that had that kind of secular twist in him that i i went on dates with through a matchmaker um and i was so into this guy david and uh but david only wanted to date through the matchmaker and so you know we were going on dates after the three date mark david and, and I, I was like, oh my God, yes, I want to keep going out with this guy. He lived in he lived in Florida. And so, you know, he flew to LA to go on dates with me. I flew to Florida to go on dates with him. And then after like the three date mark, I was seeing that he still wasn't 
trying to get my number. He still wasn't communicating to me directly. He only wanted to go through the matchmaker. So I already knew like, okay, this isn't very serious because usually like after three dates it's, or even earlier, sometimes the guys are going to be more willing to try to get your number. But this guy wasn't doing that. He wasn't trying to get my number. And so we kept going on dates and I think we went on like maybe seven dates. And after seven dates, I was like, I could tell that David wasn't very serious, even though I was so into him. And, you know, at that point, I started traveling. I was traveling to New York and I was starting to go to secular college. And I wasn't telling people, but I was like starting. I think I was like 21. I was like starting to like get in. Yeah, I was 21. I was starting to get in the idea of maybe starting to like leave the community, but like I didn't, I didn't want to leave it straight up. I just wanted to like become more lenient and get more in the secular world while still keeping my faith. So after seven dates, I realized that not only was David like refusing to communicate with me through the matchmaker, he was also making sure our dates were very limited to like only two hours at a time. And like, Usually if a guy really liked you, you know, I that's all the only exposure I had to guys a lot was like through This system and then there was this one guy that I was talking to on the phone That I was kind of learning about dating through and I was also learning a little bit through my cousin I had a male cousin that I would talk about dating ask him questions about guys Through and I was just so I was so clueless about men so but all I knew was that like, we passed the three dates, he's still not getting my number, and he's also like limiting our dates to like only two hours at a time. So I could tell that David wasn't very serious about me. Um, and I knew that like, I also wanted to like leave the community anyway. So like, at that time, I basically gave David, David an ultimatum. I was basically like, through the matchmaker, I told the matchmaker to tell him like, okay, I sent him an email, her an email. And I said, so I really like David, but like it feels really hard to communicate with him. And I feel like I don't really know him because we're only communicating through text. Oh, sorry, we're only communicating through the matchmaker. So I asked her, I said like, I really like you to the matchmaker, but like, I also don't really feel close to David at all this way that we're dating. So either like, if he's interested, maybe he can text me or call me directly at some point or like, you know, like maybe we shouldn't, maybe we should like, we, you know, I don't know if this is gonna go anywhere. And, you know, I feel bad that I, you know, I feel bad to give ultimatums. You know, I've given ultimatums to guys in the past, but in that case, I just felt like I liked this guy so much that I knew that if I didn't do that, I would get so attached. And I didn't want to be attached to that community anyway. I wanted to leave. So, so she did that. She gave, she, she, she was a really nice lady. Um, she's actually still a family friend. So, uh, the matchmaker passed that information along to David and David said, I understand. And yeah, we don't, we didn't really have a connection. So I don't want to keep dating. So we didn't, we didn't talk anymore. And then like, I remember like over since that time, like I started to like make my leave out of the community. And like, you know, I was going to college, going traveling. I started traveling and I started like eventually planting the seeds for like leaving, you know, going off the derach, leaving the Orthodox Jewish faith. And um, over time, I started to get messages from the matchmaker, like, you know, over the span of like every six months, I would get messages from the matchmaker and she would reach out to me and be like, hey, Pardes, you know, David's interested in going out with you again. You know, he's interested, whatever. And she would do that and I'd be like, are you sure? Cause like, if he was interested, he would, he has my number, right? Like he could reach out to me directly. And she would be like, um, yeah, I'm sure or whatever, like, and she'll talk to him and she'd be like, okay, okay, I'm gonna get David to call you. So she would get David to call me. And then David, and so like, that was like the only 
like since I started to leave the community and I started actually exploring with like secular dating David was like the only person that I still kind of was thinking about in the orthodox dating thing so then she'd be like okay like yeah I'll tell David to call you so you know David would call me and then he would you know we would talk on the phone a little bit and then he'd be like you know what I realized that like actually I don't want to go out with you again and then I'd be like okay so we we wouldn't talk and then another six months would pass and then David wanted to call again and this went on and then he would do the same thing he would call he would tell the matchmaker like that he went, wanted to actually like go out with me again the matchmaker would reach out to me and be like yeah David still wants to go out with you again and I'd be like uh but like he's not reaching out to me directly remember like he's reaching out to you <laughs> and it was almost like it, it became almost like a game where I think it lasted for about five years because when it finished I was 27 so maybe like two years ago or actually no I was 26 so 21 through 26 I think it lasted this back and forth lasted for about five years where like I was long gone I was like out of the community I was dating in the secular world and I'll, I'll make another video about dating in the secular world as an ex-orthodox Jew uh, which I'm sure it's gonna be really interesting but I was still actually still having this back and forth with David who was still in the community and he would like reach out to the matchmaker be like I'm still interested in parts and because I had we had this whole back and forth like I would be like kind of intrigued and I'd be like okay yeah he wants to like still talk like okay like tell him to call me <laughs> and then he would call me and then he would like we would talk and then he would like quickly change his mind again and so uh I remember when I was 26 years old and he and this happened like every six months every six months he would do this and he would want to talk and then he would change his mind and he would not want to talk anymore and then you know after so when I was about 26 the summer I remember it was summertime uh he actually I think he reached out to me directly and then he was like, you know, so I think it was, he reached out to me directly. Oh no, it was through the matchmaker again. He did the same thing, yes. So he did the same thing, he reached out again. And then I was like interested. And then he did the same thing where he like, after I said I was interested in talking to him again, he was like, and, and I, I would push a little bit. I'd be like, are you sure? Like, is he sure? Is he sure that he wants to? And he'd be like, yeah, yeah, I'm sure. And then I'd be like, okay, yeah, let's do it. And then as soon as I would say, yeah, let's do it, he would change his mind again. So, uh, so yeah, I was 26 years old in the summer of, uh, this is three years ago. So in the summer of 2019, after he did that, I was like, wait, I'm not gonna let him like end this again without an explanation because like, I don't understand what's happening and I wanna like get, I want to like figure this out once and for all so I call him back and I'm like this is important I need to talk to you and he's like okay what's going on and I said so like for the past five years we've been doing this back and forth where you say that you want to like go out with me and then you change your mind and then you say you don't you want to go out with me and you're trying and by this time like I wasn't attracted to him anymore you know like when I had first started going out with him because he was the first secular, he wasn't even secular, but bef because he was the first guy that I had met that I liked that was kind of had a secular vibe, I was attracted to him at that time. But over the years, like that kind of faded because I just didn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't know him. And also like, I didn't, you know, I didn't know, know him too well. And also like, I didn't, uh, you know, I was just in a different world. I had met so many secular people since then. So, uh, so that it wasn't as interesting and as, ex as exciting as it was back then. So at this point, it was more just intrigue, like why this back and forth every six months, what happened? And, uh, you know, just what's going on? Like, I really actually liked you and I really wanted to date you. And like, I really wanted to do this. And like, you, you just kept doing this back and forth. And he said, well, the truth is, 
that um, I was, I was, whenever I call you and then I change my mind, the truth is like the way that it happens is that I get horny and I heard that you're not religious anymore and like in the, in the Orthodox community, religious girls aren't going to give me like, you know, the temporary gratification that I need. But since I heard that you're not religious anymore, um, I thought maybe you'd want to do that with me because I remember that you were attracted to me. So I thought maybe I could fly you out and you could like, you know, you know, have sex with me and, you know, do some stuff with me. And then, uh, like, we don't have to talk about this again. And when he said that, I was like, oh my gosh, like, I felt like a little silly because like, I didn't know what was happening. And I was actually like, so enthralled by him back then. And I had no idea the difference between like a guy that was into you just for temporary gratification versus like someone that wanted to marry you because I was just in such a different world. I was so naive. And so then I was like, well, you know, like just because I'm not religious anymore, it doesn't mean that all I want to do is temporary gratification. You know, like I still want long, long term love. I still want like, you know, a family and all these things, you know, it doesn't mean that I've just dropped all of that, you know, but that was like the end of that chapter. And he never did that again. He never reached out to me again. And then uh, that was like really the end of my secular, that, sorry, that was really the end of my orthodox dating. Um, that was like completely the end of it. And, um, yeah, ever since then, you know, I haven't, I haven't really, uh, had to do any of that anymore. Um, I've just been dating through the secular way, which has been quite an experience in itself, and I'm excited to tell you more about it in future videos. Um, also, sorry that these videos are so long-winded and not very organized thoughts. It's just that I have so much to say on every topic that it could just go on and on and on forever. Like, even this video, it could just keep going on and on if I don't, like, give it, like, an end time. That's how Orthodox Jewish dating was for me. And actually, there's another video, like, years ago, and a live stream that my friend, my childhood friend Lila and I talked about a little bit about this, Orthodox dating, how it was for us, and we compared our experiences a little bit. Um, every, but for everybody, it's different, and uh, this is how it was for me in my community, um, but there's obviously so many different types of people in the world, so many different variations of Orthodox Jews and ultra Orthodox Jews and Hasidic Jews and you know it's it's different for everybody so this is just my experience and you know I'm sure there's going to be some people that find parallels with mine but maybe had something a little different so if you had an experience like that I would love to hear about it in the comments you know if you reach out to me I'd love to like and maybe have a live stream with you, maybe where we talk about it or we compare our experiences. And if you have any questions, I would love that too. Uh, any topic ideas for another video. All right, thanks. See you guys later.